It is a pleasure to be able to uh, speak at MRT Week uh, 2020. Um, I'm Ian McDonald. I'm a fourth year resident in the Combined Nuclear Medicine and Radiology Program at Dalhousie University in Havas, Nova Scotia. And today I wanted to talk about cerebral enlightenment nuclear medicine in brain imaging. A few learning objectives. First, to review a select spectrum of nuclear medicine studies pertaining to the central nervous system. I'd like to cover to understand some of the common indications for uh, CNS nuclear medicine studies. And finally, to review some of the future directions, which I find um, particularly exciting for nuclear medicine as it pertains to the brain. In terms of disclosures, I am a co inventor on several patents, um, but will not be talking about any of this work today. So in terms of an overview, these are the um, topics I'd like to um, cover. And this is really a uh, select selection of uh, nuclear medicine uh, techniques that we can use um, with respect to the central nervous system. So just to start with CSF shunts, and as a reminder, our cerebral spinal fluid is produced by the choroid plexus predominantly in the lateral ventricles and the third ventricles within the brain. This fluid then goes and bathes the spinal cord and um, uh, exits around the cerebellum and bathes the brain before being um, resorbed. So really any obstruction along the uh, course of this pathway can cause um, elevated back pressure, um, hydrocephalus as it's called, and can uh, present with um, classic uh, clinical symptoms. So um, if this were to occur, um, a lot of times um, our neurosurgery colleagues will place a drain into the lateral ventricles to drain some of this fluid and, and alleviate that. And that's really where the nuclear medicine troubleshooting comes in. So these shunts, can be in the ventricle, and then they can drain into the abdomen, they can drain into the heart, into the uh, thorax as well. Um, and this is really for the treatment of obstructive hydrocephalus. There's lots of complications that can happen with CSF shunt, but um, in particular for nuclear medicine, um, the uh, one that we can address is catheter blockage. Um, and so, Typically, when an individual comes in and they're having um, uh, a clinical presentation that may represent a shunt blockage, the first thing we do is um, a bunch of radiographs to follow the course of the shunt to make sure that um, there's nowhere that, that this tube has been broken off or fractured. And it's a little small, but but you can follow the tube length. So so here's the tip of the tube residing in the uh, ventricle, and then it's coming out of the ventricle and brain and overlying the uh, skull. And there's a small port that, that we'll look at um, on the side here. And then if you follow the tube line, it goes down through the neck, and we can see it's going down the left side of this patient's neck. It traverses the chest and goes down into the abdomen where there's a line of tube coiled in, in the abdomen. Now you might notice that there's some tubing discarded um, around the abdomen. So, so this individual has had a previous BP shunt um, and a lot of times uh, when the tubes are in for a while, they'll be um, scarred down and um, therefore can't be easily retrieved and uh, therefore is, is just discarded um, tubing. So, as long as this tube appears intact on radiographs and there's a clinical concern that there might be a blockage, that's when nuclear medicine steps in. So um, really, what, what does this test entail? Well, um, typically we use a DTPA and um, this is um, before injection, um, um, confirmed to be pyrogen free as, as we're injecting and there's potential for this to um, radiopharmaceutical to enter the ventricles. We want to make sure of the hydrogen free status. It's instilled into the shunt reservoir, which I'll show you in a second. And then we do serial or dynamic imaging to um, assess the expected antigrade flow. And I have an example of this. So here's a CT image, a coronal CT image 
And so here's the um, shunt tubing and, and, and this would progress in, into the ventricles. And then we see the shunt tubing going down and, and this in this particular case will end up in the abdomen. So this is the uh, shunt reservoir and uh, highlighted with this red arrow is, is where we would um, um, uh, target to inject the DTPA radiopharmaceutical. So really what we want to do is fill this reservoir with the radiopharmaceutical and then see that, that everything is, is flowing as expected. So here's an example of, um, of a case at our institution. So, so here on our uh, dynamic images, we have the radiopharmaceutical that's been injunct, in, injected into the shunt reservoir. And then we see by the time we get the patient underneath our camera, that there's already been anterograde flow down towards the, the, the abdomen. And then when, when we take a, a static picture of the uh, abdomen, we see that, that there has been a free spill of the radiopharmaceutical as expected in the abdomen. So this is a uh, working shunt um, with no issues. Now, if there was in fact a shunt blockage, um, it's really not much to see. We would again see radiopharmaceutical filling the reservoir. However, we wouldn't see uh, any anterograde flow to, towards the abdomen. It would essentially be, um, you would have stasis um, of the radiopharmaceutical in, in that reservoir. And that's really um, the two outcomes that, that we're looking at for, for these studies. So I wanna talk next about brain death. So really brain death is a clinical diagnosis. However, this can um, on occasion be quite difficult to make. And some of the reversible causes of um, uh, clinical brain death could be heavy sedation, drug intoxication, metabolic derangement, or hypothermia. And so really it's quite an important diagnosis to get right. And really the accuracy and Speed is critical for timely clinical decision making. Um, I think number one is, is um, just to help with family decision makings around what can be a very difficult time. And then one of the uh, common requests uh, to our nuclear medicine department is in terms of organ donation, where there, uh, it is uh, a time sensitive um, process. And so, um, there's several rate of pharmaceuticals you can use for this. Um, typically, HMPAO or DTPA is used at our institution. We predominantly use HMPAO, um, which is a brain perfusion agent. Um, this is done as a dynamic flow study, and then static images are obtained in a, a variety of um, positions. And so, um, just looking at a case from the literature of a DTPA um, study. So the patient is injected with the radiopharmaceutical and we see over 12 seconds that we have filling of the carotid arteries leading up to the uh, brain. We have central accumulation of the radiopharmaceutical and this is denoted as the hot nose sign. Um, and really this is just filling from the um, external carotid arteries rather than internal carotid arteries. And we see where the uh, expected location of the brain is. We really don't see much uh, radiopharmaceutical uptake at all. Um, looking at a study from our own institution, so on the dynamic imaging, we have uh, uh, the injection come in, the radiopharmaceutical is uh, going through the heart, and then we see filling of the uh, carotid arteries. Again, we have the hot nose sign. And then really where we would expect the brain um, using HMPAO, which is a perfusion agent, we really don't see much localization. And this is quite evident. So this is a case of a 43-year-old patient that uh, developed acute meningoencephalitis. Um, on clinical exam, she had an absent pupil reflex. However, Secondary to uh, elevated blood pressure was on uh, quite heavy sedation. And so they really wanted to uh, confirm the diagnosis of brain death. And we see on the static images that um, where the brain is, we really don't see any radiopharmaceutical localization. You'll see that, that there is 
uh, radiopharmaceutical in the overlying scalp. And again, the external carotid arteries um, still have perfusion, but the internal carotid arteries uh, that are supplying the brain, um, there's no um, perfusion through those. And, and this can confirm some of the findings we see on CT. So this is a coronal uh, CT of, of the same patient. Um, as you know, we have gray matter, which is on the outside of our brain, and white matter, which is a little bit deeper. And you can maybe confabulate that there are some differences, but really that gray-white differentiation is lost in this patient. Also, that coliform appearance of, of the brain, the gyri and sulci are, are really not evident. So this is indicative of widespread edema and confirmed with our uh, brain death study uh, in terms of this particular patient. So next I wanted to talk a little bit about Parkinsonism. And really in terms of nuclear medicine, um, we're referring to, um, or what I want to talk about is the uh, DAT scan. And this is really a test that is combined with clinical and anatomic imaging for the investigation of movement disorders with Parkinsonian features. Um, Parkinsonism is sort of an umbrella term and, and there's lots of uh, potential uh, disorders underneath that um, umbrella. But really what, what, what we're looking to do with nuclear medicine is to confirm that there's dopaminergic neuron loss in a uh, Parkinsonism uh, patient and really to distinguish from treatable disorders such as the central tremor, as well as drug-induced Parkinsonism, which um, would not entail neuron loss and can be effectively treated. Although it's commonly utilized for workup of Parkinson's disease, as I mentioned, dopaminergic changes are found in many other central nervous system disorders, multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, Lewy body dementia and cortical basal degeneration, to name a few, are all under that umbrella. So, what are really we really targeting with uh, that scan? It's really the dopamine transporter, and this is at the presynaptic nigrostriatal axon. So, what does that all mean? So, here's just a general schematic of a uh, neuronal synapse. So, we have the sending neuron, the receiving neuron, and then the synapse here in the middle. If we zoom in on this synapse, we have neurotransporter. So this would be dopamine in this case. So dopamine gets packaged into these vesicles, then gets released into the synapse um, where it interacts with a receptor and then a cellular response is sent. Now, our body's pretty good. So, so some of this dopamine gets degraded. Our body's pretty good at, at, in fact, recycling. So there's a dopamine transporter that takes up dopamine again and, and recycles this, packages it again for the next signal that's sent. And really, this dopamine transporter is, is what we're targeting um, with our radiopharmaceutical. And where we're really looking with, with the brain, so, so, so here's the brain. If we take a cross-section through it, so, so an axial section, so this is the front of the brain, and this is the back of the brain, and cerebellum, we're really looking at the caudate and the patamen, which together are termed the striatum. And this is one of the main dopaminergic um, centers of, of the brain, where, where a lot of these dopaminergic signals are sent from the um, brainstem. And really, you can envision that this almost looks like a comma. So we have the caudate head being the uh, top of the comma and then the, the patamen being down. So, so really when, when we're looking at these studies, we're looking that, that the striatum looks like a comma. So just to highlight a, a few of these. So this is a 43-year-old male that had Parkinsonian features. Again, these patients are typically seen by our uh, neurology colleagues are extensively uh, uh, worked up. And then when there's um, issues for what could be sort of the underlying nature, in particular in this quite young patient, um, that's where a DAP scan can, can be very beneficial. So these are just actual images uh, th throughout the brain. Um, and then when we see, when we get into the uh, striatum, we see that on, on both sides of the brain that we have a nice comma sign, the striatum um, is, uh, demonstrating good localization of the radiopharmaceutical, and this is in fact a normal study. So 
So it's Parkinsonian features that are noted clinically are not secondary to dopaminergic um, neuronal loss um, um, with involvement of, of the striatum. Now contrast that with this other case. Again, uh, quite a young patient, a 56-year-old female. Again, Parkinsonian features, um, movement issues on a clinical exam. And then we can see as we get into the striatum that we've lost that typical comma sign on the right side of the brain, the caudate and the batamen are uh, uh, decreased. The caudate on the left side is, is probably normal, but we see that the batamen is significantly uh, decreased as well. So um, this is uh, not normal scan, so an abnormal scan. Um, and this is indicating that that presynaptic um, uh, neuronal uh, dysfunction. And so just side by side, again, we're looking for a nice comma sign. We see it in the first case we looked at, which was normal. And then our not normal, we have bilateral involvement of the striatum. I want to move on next to epilepsy. And really, the nuclear medicine role in epilepsy is to help localize the seizure focus. Um, and this is typically in medical refractory seizures. Really, this is done in conjunction with the clinical presentation, the neurological exam, um, as well as anatomic imaging, typically um, uh, MR, as well as EEG. And really, this is a uh, troubleshooting method when it's sort of unclear where the seizure focus might be. There's broadly two different ways to, to, to do these studies. Um, You'll hear the term ictal use, and this really means during a seizure, and then interictal, and that's between seizures. And, and um, you can potentially image the brain and with nuclear medicine techniques for, for both of them. When we talk about ictal, this is um, in particular spec imaging, um, either with HMPAO or um, ECD, and um, the reason why you can't do PET imaging is it's hard to get the um, fluorinated SDG uh, radiopharmaceutical at the bedside ready to inject while the patient's having a seizure and then get them down to the uh, PET scanner. So um, with the longer lived technetium radiopharmaceuticals, that, that becomes somewhat easier, but um, again, does represent a significant logistical challenge. It's a little bit easier with interictal imaging, and this is between seizures. So this can be scheduled um, either on an inpatient or outpatient basis. And really, we can use PET or SPECT uh, to do interictal uh, imaging. And uh, in Halifax, we um, predominantly use um, uh, PET for, for um, uh, this evaluation. So as I mentioned, um, the Typically, brain perfusion equals brain metabolism. There are some um, extraordinary cases that have been described, in particular in stroke and um, also in some scenarios such as depression, where um, um, nuclear medicine imaging with perfusion agents, so each, such as HMPAO and metabolic agents such as um, FPG, do not um, exactly correspond. And, Really, the reason behind that, um, there's lots of speculation, but, but, but we really don't know. And um, for the vast majority of the time, perfusion does equal metabolism. And really, it's related to how the brain is functioning. So as I mentioned, there's a variety of radiopharmaceuticals, predominantly HMPAO or ECD for the perfusion imaging, and then FDG for metabolic imaging. So in terms of interictal imaging, um, really what, what we're doing is uh, using these metabolic or, or perfusion agents. We typically um, uh, perform the study and then we fuse that data with anatomic imaging and that's preferably an MR and that, that, can, that MR kit can be done on our typical diagnostic scanners and can, can be done um, either in advance or, or after the uh, nuclear medicine study. It does not need to occur at the same time. And really, when we talk about interictal imaging, 
it's expected to produce hypometabolism or perfusion in the area of the epileptogenic focus um, and sort of a broader area as well. And this is converse to ictal imaging where we would, and so during a seizure with more activity, you'd expect to see more metabolism and more perfusion uh, to an area. So interictal, we're looking for lower metabolism and lower perfusion, um, sort of a refractory period after someone has had a seizure. So just an example of this. So this is a 40 year old male um, on EEG, um, there was seizure capture from both temporal lobes, so both left and right. And really the question for us was to try to evaluate, um, was there, could there be some asymmetry in uh, the metabolism in the temporal lobes to further try to identify where the seizure focus uh, can be. When it's unclear like this, um, so an EEG study has electrodes that go over the scalp and then there's brain readings and then they uh, try to pinpoint where it is in the brain. One of the goals of, of, of this study is, is to see if we can pinpoint uh, anatomically to a site and then potentially a neurosurgeon can go in and implant electrodes. So put electrodes into the brain around the site of uh, interest to try to uh, uh, narrow down where that particular focus is. You imagine that is quite an invasive procedure. So to have a, um, uh, an exact site is certainly uh, preferential. So we see in this uh, example, so uh, young patients, so this is interictal imaging. So the patient has had a recent seizure and then we're imaging um, between the onset to the next seizure. And we can see when we look at the right temporal lobe and we compare it to the left temporal lobe that, that there's more red over here, there's more uh, metabolism and there seems to be hypometabolism in this area. We can see it on our axial slices as well. And I put big arrows to, to, to point this out. So there is asymmetry in these temporal lobes. It's lower on the right than, than the left. It suggests that there is an epileptogenic focus somewhere in this uh, right temporal lobe, potentially to the left as well. We haven't excluded that, but certainly uh, this is where the predominant hypometabolism is. And so we've given now a general area of, of where further investigation uh, can, can be targeted for this uh, particular uh, individual. So this is our fused FDG data with an MRI to give us um, both the uh, functional and then anatomic uh, uh, data when we interpret these studies. So I want to um, chat next about neurodegenerative disorders, and this is probably the biggest part of the um, uh, talk and certainly uh, is an exciting uh, focus in, in, in nuclear medicine. Um, and really, you can make these um, really awful lists of, of uh, quite a few uh, uh, disorders. Um, I like to sort of try to break them down into what's happening in the brain. And uh, a lot of people um, uh, think of things as, as essentially protein misfolding disorders. So proteins in the brain are doing things that they're not supposed to do. And we can group all these different dementias um, um, with respect to, to, to what proteins might, might be going wrong. So we have our tauopathies. So um, one of the most prevalent is the frontal temporal lobar dementia, alpha synucleinopathies, the most prevalent being um, uh, Lewy body dementia, or dementia with Lewy bodies. We have prion diseases, which, which we um, won't um, touch on um, today. And this is uh, CJD. And and then really the most prevalent of um, all of the uh, neurodegenerative diseases and uh, uh, dementia spectrum, Alzheimer's disease, which, which we'll talk about. Um, so uh, just to remind you, brain perfusion equals metabolism majority of time and that our brain function is related to perfusion metabolism. Again, we can use a variety of um, radiopharmaceuticals, HMPAO or FDG. Um, in Halbex, we predominantly use uh, now FEG for the workup of these patients. And really what we're asked to do is clinically unclear cases. 
So, so um, an individual uh, presents with uh, dementia type uh, symptoms, and these can be a variety of symptoms um, from memory to executive uh, dysfunction to visuospatial difficulties. Um, they're worked up clinically. It's really unclear what might be going on. All of these individuals will all have anatomic imaging. Unfortunately, in particular, early on in a lot of uh, neurodegenerative disease, anatomic imaging is completely normal. And so that's where uh, nuclear medicine can step in and hopefully provide some clarity. So I have a few cases to uh, uh, demonstrate um, some of these concepts. So uh, the first one here was a 48-year-old woman who had persistent severe cognitive impairment for the past 2.5 years. And this really followed a relatively minor work-related head injury. Um, and it was thought that the, the degree of impairment, the severe cognitive impairment, was out of proportion to the expected uh, injury course. Uh, and this patient was um, um, had been followed for, for uh, a number of years by neurology. And so we did a FEG uh, PET study on, on this individual. And so these are the uh, axial slices throughout the brain. Um, and then our uh, stills from our rotating uh, images of the brain. Um, and really when, when we look at this, we see a pretty homogenous distribution of the radiopharmaceutical. There's typically a little bit of uh, lower activity in the temporal lobes. And, um, in fact, this was a completely normal study. And I wanted to start with this one just to show uh, what a uh, normal uptake looked like of FDG. And um, with the perfusion agents such as HMPAO, it would be a similar look, um, what this looks like in the brain. And second, I wanted to highlight that um, uh, despite the advances and as, as powerful as nuclear medicine can be, there, there are still things we miss. So this is a young lady with persistent, severe cognitive impairment. There's clearly something going on with her brain. Um, and at least with our uh, current scanners and our current radio pharmaceuticals of, of FDG, we just really can't get to the bottom of, of what's happening in this individual. So let's look at um, a few other cases. So this is uh, another young lady, 53-year-old woman with cognitive decline, several year history of obsessive features, had memory impairment, and uh, decreased uh, IADLs. These are uh, activities of daily living. In 2015, so she was uh, followed for this uh, memory impairment, this is the mini mental status examination. So a 30 out of a 30 is a uh, perfect mark. Um, that's normal. So everyone listening would be 30 out of 30, I'm sure. Um, this is a Montreal cognitive assessment scale. So again, a 30 out of 30 would, would be normal. So we see back in 2015, there was some impairment. Just one year later, we now have severe impairment of uh, cognition. And really, um, in the intervening years, so, so just within four years, um, this relatively young lady um, became nonverbal and required uh, around the clock care. She was followed both by psychiatry and neurology. Um, and a unifying diagnosis um, uh, could not be achieved. And so uh, we were asked to uh, help out. And so we did, um, again, a FDG PET study, and we see, um, unlike our last case, that there are areas that look uh, a little bit more purple, have some hypometabolism compared to other areas. If we look at the brain here, we see predominantly the frontal lobes bilaterally are involved. We see the temporal lobes bilaterally are, are involved as well. So we have a frontal temporal pattern of hypometabolism. Just to compare this to our first case, so again, we had our normal uptake, and now this case, frontal temporal hypometabolism. And really, in conjunction with the uh, clinical picture, um, this is in keeping with a frontal temporal lobar dementia. There's a bunch of different variants that um, individuals can uh, present with, and they can have some subtle uh, differences on um, FDG PET imaging. 
as I mentioned, anatomically, these are initially normal. However, it can progress to uh, diffuse atrophy and most pronounced in that frontal temporal uh, lobes. And, and really uh, on our FDG PET uh, imaging, really the frontal and anterior temporal lobes as we saw in our case demonstrate hypometabolism. You can have uh, basal, ganglia, basal ganglia involvement later in the disease process. And this really takes us into uh, the tau opathies. And so really this all involves tau, which is a microtubule associated protein. There's lots of different forms of it within the brain. And um, really it's this hyperphosphorylation that, that gives us the issues or is thought to give us the issues. So, so this is just a schematic of a neuron and we have our microtubule here, which is a, uh, um, a support structure and tau is part of that support structure. There's some sort of process that goes on and we don't understand why. It hyperphosphorylates it, but puts um, phosphorylation groups on aspects of tau. And what this does is tau dissociates. It starts to form these paired filaments and then starts to tangle within the brain. And we get a bunch of intracellular tangles and it's thought to choke off the neuron leading to neuronal death. When we um, stain for the tau protein, and this is in a post-mortem um, human brain, we see that, that this tangle um, within a neuron and it's thought to choke off the neurons in, in these brains. So moving on with another case. So this is now a 76 year old man with progressive visual spatial difficulties, including prosopagnosia, which is face blindness. And again, followed by neurology without sort of a clear picture of what might be going on, just given these visual spatial difficulties. So again, we've done an FDG PET um, study. What we see is there's maybe a little bit of decreased metabolism in the frontal lobes, but most predominantly is hypometabolism in the parietal lobes. We see parietal lobes here, but also hypometabolism in the occipital lobe where the visual cortex sits, also the uh, temporal lobes as well bilaterally. There's a bonus finding on um, this particular study and there is intense uh, uptake um, uh, of a lesion here, and this was just an incidental pituitary adenoma. Um, so it had nothing to do with the patient's, um, uh, likely nothing to do with the patient's clinical um, presentation, but we see this metabolic defects, predominantly parietal, temporal lobes, as well as occipital lobe involvement, putting this together with the clinical picture. Again, we can look at the differences between the normal brain, and this is most in keeping with uh, dementia Lewy bodies or Lewy body dementia. And really, this is characterized clinically, changes in thinking, reasoning, memory loss. It has well-formed visual hallucinations, and you can have Parkinsonism as well. Um, anatomically, again, initially normal. And then our FDG PET findings, similar to what we saw in our case, parietal temporal hypometabolism with involvement of the visual cortex, um, typically sparing the uh, primary visual cortex as well as motor cortex. And so this brings us into our next category of uh, dementia. And these are alpha-synucleinopathies. And really alpha-synuclein is a presynaptic protein. We still don't know what it does. It's not completely known. Again, there's been lots of research about um, uh, uh, reported functions of this. But what we do know is, again, there's some sort of aggregation progress uh, process to form insoluble fibrils. Um, and so just schematically, so again, we have an alpha synuclein protein. For some reason, it starts to aggregate first into an oligomer and then this protofibril and then uh, longer um, uh, fibril aggregates. And in fact, these aggregates catalyze formation of, of um, the oligomer process. Uh, so it's sort of a self-fulfilling process. And um, then you get thought to be choking out of, of the neurons and then neuronal death. And again, when we look at the uh, human brain, 
stain for uh, a Louis body. We see uh, in the brown here a prominent Louis body in, in this brain. Our next case is a 52 year old with history of progressive memory worsening for the last three years. When we look at the um, uh, clinical study of how they're doing in terms of cognition, we see in 2015, a bit of impairment, and in particular for a 52-year-old, this would be um, uh, quite a bit lower than expected. And we see 2016, 2017, there's this gradual decline, followed by neurology, quite a uh, young man. So again, question of what might be going on we do the FDG PET uh, imaging, and what we can see is quite predominant parietal lobe, temporal lobe, hypometabolism. Frontal lobe is likely down a little bit as well, but predominantly uh, temporal parietal hypometabolism. Unlike our previous case, we see that the visual cortex is now spared. And so putting this together, looking at our, our normal brain, this is Alzheimer's disease, putting it together with the uh, uh, clinical presentation. And we know Alzheimer's disease is really characterized by cognitive dysfunction, predominantly memory loss, language difficulties, executive dysfunction uh, issues. There can be psychiatric and behavioral uh, disturbances. Again, anatomic imaging, so this CT or MRI, MRI is initially normal, uh, can get progression later in the disease. Um, and then with our FDG PET, we see that in particular, posterior cingulate, parietal, medial temporal hypometabolism, and then later on in, in disease, you can have frontal lobe in, in involvement. So these were some of the um, uh, main uh, hypometabolism, and you'd see the same thing with perfusion uh, nuclear medicine imaging, say with HMPAO and um, some of the more prevalent uh, dementias. So here was our case of uh, uh, normal metabolism, our pattern of frontal temporal dementia with just like the name says, frontal temporal hypometabolism, our dementia with Lewy bodies that had parietal and temporal hypometabolism, involvement posteriorly of the um, occipital lobe, uh, had the bonus incidental pituitary um, adenoma. And then our Alzheimer's disease case, which had prominent parietal and temporal lobe hypometabolism, as well as some um, likely frontal um, hypometabolism as well. So we can see that nuclear medicine and in uh, cases, um, in particular young individuals with uh, sort of atypical clinical presentations, our anatomic imaging, CT and MRI can be completely normal in these individuals, but with um, some of our uh, nuclear medicine uh, techniques, we can see uh, profound, profound deficits, which uh, help shore up the clinical diagnosis and um, really move along for potential management of, of these patients. So it's a very powerful method. So, I just wanted to take the uh, a little bit of time to just chat about some of the future directions um, for uh, nuclear medicine in the brain. And this is in particular to do with uh, dementia imaging. And uh, it's a particular interest uh, of mine. And I, I think it's a really uh, exciting field that has been developing for several years now. And I think we're gonna continue to see some significant advances and um, likely, um, uh, um, advances of, of a lot of these uh, techniques into our uh, regular, or at least semi-regular uh, clinical practice. So I really just wanted to talk about Alzheimer's disease with a focus um, uh, on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was a uh, survey that the Alzheimer's Society of uh, Canada had done um, a few years ago now, but, but I think it um, sort of hits home how, how big of an issue Alzheimer's is. So within Canada, it's um, uh, projected that about half a million um, individuals live with uh, Alzheimer's disease, but we see that within a generation, this is going to do more than double. In terms of what we spend on Alzheimer's disease, it's about $15 billion uh, per year now. Within a generation, this is expected to go up to $153 billion, so over 10 times the uh, cost. And 
And really, um, one of the big issues is the time of informal care. So this is care by friends and family. Right now, Canadians are spending 231 million hours um, providing this informal care, and this is expected to about triple within a generation as well. And um, our um, our neighbors to, to the south, you can imagine that that um, all of these numbers are are essentially increased by a factor of of 10, and so. You can imagine just here in North America what a huge uh, impact Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia is and is going to be, um, and also worldwide. So there's a lot of focus on being able to do something um, about this um, uh, disease. And um, as many of you now uh, know already that there is no um, um, effective treatment, we can sort of help people out cognitively for a little bit with some of our clinical medications, but really we have nothing in our toolbox to slow or stop the disease currently. And so I think that this is uh, an area that nuclear medicine can really have a role in. And so um, to um, to know where we're going, I think it's important to um, uh, know a little bit of where we started. So um, it was actually in Frankfurt in um, 1901 that um, uh, Alzheimer, pictured here, saw the first patient that uh, was uh, uh, later termed to have Alzheimer's disease, um, Auguste D. And uh, this was the uh, happy looking um, uh, institute um, where uh, Alzheimer worked in Frankfurt, which has now been demolished. So he described the clinical presentation of um, Auguste D. And in fact, um, some of uh, Alzheimer's original notebooks have uh, survived. And this is, in fact, Auguste um, 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 providing multiple attempts to, to write her name out and having significant issues with writing names and having conversations. And this was all detailed by Alzheimer. What was uh, exceptional at that time was, in fact, when um, I guess the uh, later died so several years later. Um, Alzheimer and a few other pathologists uh, looked at her brain and uh, described some peculiar structures that were uh, hanging around in the uh, brain, which they thought might be involved with Alzheimer's. And in fact, in a uh, dusty basement in Munich, many years later, in fact, um, the original slides that Alzheimer uh, and colleagues had, prepare, had prepared of Auguste's brain uh, were found. And so um, we see, similar to uh, Alzheimer's drawings, that these slides of uh, Auguste's uh, brain demonstrate these, these uh, um, uh, peculiar de deposits that, that are in the brain. And uh, this was published uh, a number of years ago now. What we now know um, over 100 years later is what Alzheimer was describing was in fact beta amyloid protein. And um, despite it being um, 100 years later, we really have little idea of what beta amyloid does normally in the brain. What we do know is that similar to we saw with tau and alpha-synuclein, that beta amyloid aggregates to form these beta amyloid plaques, and that's what Alzheimer's saw in those first slides. And really these plaques, the role in Alzheimer's disease and neurodegeneration um, in general are not fully known. It's thought that they're likely involved in Alzheimer's disease, um, but really we, we don't know if, if um, what sort of role they, that they might be contributing. And so when we look at the postmortem human brain and we stain the brain for beta amyloid, we see these uh, plaques that almost looks like a, uh, a nova that you'd see uh, uh, in our sky. Um, and really this is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, the tau neurofibrillary tangle, which we saw was involved in other dementias, such as frontal lobar dementia, is also involved in Alzheimer's disease. So um, both of, of these um, um, abnormal um, protein aggregates are involved. And really, where am I going with all this? So when we look at 
this uh, graph and, and lots of individuals have um, put out something. And this is sort of the thought of, of, of where we are currently. When we look at normal to abnormal, we see that, that in terms of memory and clinic function, so at some point in an individual's life, they begin to have some memory problems. They probably don't make much of it initially, but progressively this gets worse and worse and worse until it starts affecting them um, and that we can pick up on this with some of our clinical tests that we do. Eventually the clinical function continues to get worse and at some point we go from, this is um, a mild cognitive impairment, MCI, to a diagnosis of, of dementia, so, so it gets worse. And we know the brain structure, so this is atrophy, probably starts and continues to uh, um, uh, decrease, you get cell death, neur neuronal death in your brain um, as this process continues. But where the real excitement is, is that in fact, when you look at beta amyloid and you look at tau, it's thought that these processes in the brain, so these beta amyloid plaques and these tau tangles occur and, and start to accumulate in the brain many years before clinically we can pick, pick uh, these things up. And in fact, some uh, publications and theories think that this may be up to 30 years before an individual clinically presents that, that um, uh, pathologically in the brain, we can see uh, some of these markers. Um, so in fact, if we were able to uh, look at these markers in the living brain, and in particular using nuclear medicine to look at beta amyloid or look at tau, can we identify individuals um, that are on the road to clinical Alzheimer's disease early on? And the thought is, is that if you were to start a medication or some sort of intervention at this stage, you might have much better luck um, of treating Alzheimer's disease rather than what we currently do in our clinical trials is in treating um, individuals who have a clinical diagnosis of dementia. And some people think that it's too little too late at, at that point. So it's, it's been a few years now, and this was one of the first radiopharmaceuticals for uh, beta amyloid. This was Pittsburgh Compound B, um, developed first in 2004. And we see that in an in individual with Alzheimer's disease, there's lots of red, which is um, a binding of the radiopharmaceutical to the beta amyloid plaques, lots in Alzheimer's disease, relatively um, just white matter um, binding in the control. So really no amyloid in, in the control. So we can differentiate um, Alzheimer's disease from normal brain with beta amyloid imaging. There's been lots of uh, other beta amyloid radiopharmaceuticals uh, for beta pier or amybid is probably one of the most well-known we see in, a, in uh, this publication a few years ago now, in a cognitively healthy control that we see just a little bit of white matter of binding, which is nonspecific. In an Alzheimer's disease patient, we see lots of red, there's lots of amyloid in this brain. And then we can stratify, stratify those with just mild symptoms, so mild cognitive impairment. And we can see that some people with mild cognitive impairment have lots of amyloid in their brain, and it's thought that these might be individuals that are gonna to progress to Alzheimer's disease. And then, however, there's some individuals with clinically cognitive impairment with little amyloid in their brain. And so the question is, is this individual gonna go on for Alzheimer's disease or could this be a different process going on? But it does highlight one of the issues with looking at beta amyloid. And um, this is really highlighted when we look at the uh, brain tissue itself. So this is post-mortem human brain tissue. We have gray matter and we have a little bit of white matter. This is staining for beta amyloid. We see it in a cognitively normal individual. So um, um, completely cognitively normal with clinical testing that there's really um, very little to no beta amyloid um, aggregation within their brain. If we skip to the Alzheimer's disease patient here, we see lots and lots of those beta amyloid plaques all throughout the, the, the brain. However, there's this intermediate group uh, who are cognitively normal. So on clinical cognitive testing, 
there was no identified issues. However, they have lots of beta amyloid in their brain. And really, um, from a number of studies, it's thought that potentially up to 30% of our older population are completely cognitively normal, but have lots of beta amyloid in their brain. So this raises the question that beta amyloid seems to be necessary, but not specific for Alzheimer's disease. And the fact that you have amyloid in your brain does not mean that you have Alzheimer's disease. So that has really put a damper on some of our beta amyloid imaging for that definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So I just wanna briefly talk about that other protein that aggregates in Alzheimer's disease, tau. And, and, and we know that's involved in lots of other disorders as well, but if we just focus on Alzheimer's disease, I just wanna highlight a study that came out uh, just this year by some of our, um, uh, by a Canadian group in uh, McGill. And, and they're uh, looking at this um, uh, experimental agent, MK6240. It's a fluorinated agent and it's been shown to bind to tau. And we see when they take a large group of um, uh, individuals that they can group people into how much tau is in their brain. So this is essentially just a staging system that, that they've used with uh, Stage six being that you have lots of tau in your brain and stage one that um, you have relatively little. So red is bad, red is lots of tau. So, so we see as, as we um, uh, progress along these stages that there's more and more tau uh, in the brain. And this reflects um, what we know happens um, on autopsy when, when we look at these uh, uh, brains and stain for tau. And then I just wanna highlight the uh, um, chart that was provided in this particular uh, paper. So again, they did their imaging with tau and we see that tau increases um, uh, with the staging. We see th that they also um, looked at beta amyloid in the brain, did beta amyloid uh, imaging. And we see that there are some individuals that have lots of beta amyloid in their brain that don't have any tau. And we know that there are normal people that walk around with beta amyloid in their brain, and that doesn't mean that they're cognitively impaired or destined for Alzheimer's disease. But we do see as tau increases, that beta amyloid increases in the brain, that neurodegeneration, so atrophy progresses in the brain, that people who are cognitively unimpaired, as you get more tau, this number shrinks. And in fact, at the highest tau levels, really everyone is impaired mild cognitive symptoms increase, and really dementia significantly increases as well. So there's lots of work for tau molecular imaging agents. There's arguments that they're better than beta amyloid for looking at dementia, in particular Alzheimer's disease. And it's thought that the more tau that you have um, uh, aggregated in your brain, the higher risk you are for um, having um, dementia. And so, so there's a lot of exciting work um, around uh, tau molecular imaging, and it's really uh, an area where nuclear medicine has uh, made a significant impact and I think can, will continue to. So just to summarize the, this future uh, prospect area, AD is a big problem and it's getting bigger. Early diagnosis is a challenge. Molecular imaging along with anatomic imaging can provide that early diagnosis um, and really, it's thought that, that this is going to be key for us to be able to develop effective therapies for uh, dementia. It's not something that we currently have. And really, biomarkers such as beta amyloid or tau, which I demonstrated, and there's multiple others, show great promise. And nuclear medicine is really at the forefront of, of a lot of, of this imaging. So that's really all I wanted to uh, cover today. I hope I didn't feel, um, uh, leave you um, feeling like this, but even if I did, just remember it's 2020, so please wear a mask. Um, it's um, been a great honor to, to, to be involved in uh, MRT week uh, this year. Um, I'm happy to answer any uh, questions or inquiries and my email address is here. Thank you very much.